Um, I just wanted to start out and thank uh, Chris and his team uh, for putting everything together here. Um, it's real nice to have a gathering like this for everybody to uh, come and learn about new things, old things, or, you know, like everybody says, at least add a tool uh, to their programs here. So I want to thank Chris, um, everybody for coming, and uh, we'll just get going. Um, my name is Shane Young with Natural Enemies. Uh, our company supplies beneficial insects or predatory mites for what we call chemical-free pest management. Um, I'm just going to assume with the, uh, with the amount of people here that, that beneficial insects has been possibly uh, a lot of, uh, in people's tool bags, I guess, to use uh, in cultivation at this point for cannabis or um, you know, their gardens or whatever people are growing, basically. So um, I just wanted to say that every type of application there can be, there's failures that go into it. Um, there's also positive results that come out of it. So every application that you're doing, you're learning as you go. And um, personally, I've used beneficial insects for 10 years now. And every application was always a learning curve. Um, and not every single application was always effective. And it never always gave me the results that I was looking for, which really made me look into it more on the whys and hows. And you know, did I pro improperly uh, do an application? Did I not add enough? Was the timing off? Uh, there's a lot of variables that go into it. And I must say, um, going from ornamental uh, production into cannabis cultivation has been one of the most challenging uh, for chemical free pest management, not using any sprays. Um, my background is in plant health and propagation. I, uh, I managed a nursery in Woodburn, Oregon um, for about eight years using this. And then at about the last three plus years, I've been specifically trying to make effective uh, recommendations in cannabis. And I really had to sit back and, and look at the plant itself because I've never grown it myself. Um, again, I came from ornamentals, so the thing I had to learn about it was, you know, the, the, I think that the amount the, of water that the plant demands, you know, when you're working in the soil, the soil biology and the predaceous insects that you're adding into the soil and their re reproductive cycles was different going into cannabis because of how much water is being involved. Um, I feel the explosive growth rates of the plant itself. It literally grows like a weed. So there was additional applications that needed to be made. There's more surface space that needed to be covered. Um, instead of the regular horticultural rates that you have for beneficial insects that you can find online, that you can find from insectaries that have been culturing this product for a long time. So again, we really had to step back and, and challenge myself to not necessarily make it effective, but offer growers different tools to be effective. And if one doesn't work, then we can move on to the next. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad for the opportunity to be here with you guys. I hope you'll be able to take something from this uh, moving forward on, on uh, using beneficial insects. Um, the first one comes up, when I say choose beneficial insects, obviously it's, it's a choice of your guys. It's, you know, it's not like I'm here trying to strong arm you on, on using something that you're not familiar with doing. And the thing about this is it's a, it is a different method of management that a lot of people aren't accustomed to using. And you know, I'll be the first to tell you that it's not the easiest. Um, there's lots of variables, there's a lot of trials that need to be met or used in order for you guys to be comfortable you know, to see results. And one of the biggest things is seeing to believing first. So without seeing results, a lot of people or customers or growers, they don't necessarily believe in it. So I think that's one of the first things that need to go into using it. Um, if I were to tell people that um, any of the sprays that they're doing in cannabis, if you guys were to do that, it hasn't been researched yet to see what the effects are for the end consumer. So that would be a simple reason for using or choosing beneficial insects is it's the most natural way of growing. It's nature versus nature for the most part. So it's safe and sustainable. Um, all these points that I have here, there's not really any order in them. I think there's a general importance of all of them that you know, number one could be number five and two could be three, vice versa. Um, one thing that uh, I noticed when I started using them a while back was better growth rates in a general plant. Uh, the company I worked at, they gave me, uh, after going from a propagation facility for fungus gnat issues, um, I was given six acres of greenhouse to use that were uh, separated by doors. So it was two acres 
with a sliding door, and then it was two additional acres with a door and two additional acres. And my control for the company was, uh, was the middle two acres, basically. So I did biocontrol on the outside two acres and conventional chemistry on the inside. And I just recall my production manager calling me over after about, it must have been four or five weeks, uh, kind of laughing at me, wondering what I was doing here, because on one side of the door, you could see that there was a 30% growth increase on the plants that I was using biocontrol for versus the plants that had conventional sprays. And even the sprays, you know, they're horticultural oils, uh, very, you know, I, I don't want to say safe products, but uh, soft may be a, another word for it, basically. So it wasn't like I was using harsh uh, insecticides by any means for it. So you could, s the visual was the first moment where um, I was given traction at the company to do more with it, basically. Once you, again, once you see to believe the effects of it, then I was able to do more with it. Um, another driving force, I guess you'd say, for choosing beneficial insects is uh, there's no chemical resistance at all. Um, the mode of actions that companies use for sprays, you need, to, um, you need to alternate the mode of action in order for it to be effective, for one, uh, but also number two, so that you don't build up the resistance when you continue to spray and spray and spray and that you see that nothing's happening. Um, all the pests that you have are built in, building up immunity, basically, and are able to fight off any type of chemical interaction for the most point. And at that point, they start creating, you know, super bugs is what people call them for the most part, where nothing really happens to them. You can't really take care of them. So, you know, um, when I started using predatory mites, it was one of the first things I had seen that, um, I was able to take care of a situation. I wasn't doing a cover-up spray, per se, on uh, until I was done you know, with the harvest or selling of the crops that we had. Uh, beneficial insects seem to clear up the situation entirely. They feed on the eggs, the nymphs, the adults, uh, a lot of different things in there. So uh, there's no chemical resistance. Um, obviously, it's great to be pesticide-free or chemical-free and not having to use any, any of that whatsoever in your crops that you're growing. You know, one, a lot of people are using this for medicinal purposes, um, which is great. So taking, taking that equation out of it and growing uh, your plants to it, its, highest, uh, its highest parameters, uh, obviously are gonna be the way to go. Um, and the last part here is uh, effectiveness. Um, I don't think anybody would probably use beneficial insects unless it was effective. You know, this is one of the oldest ways of control that, uh, you know, people, even before insectaries were commercializing predaceous insects, you know, it was nature versus nature. Um, I, I recall, the, you know, going back to these six acres of, of control that I was using and uh, what happened when I started doing that, as I, as I scouted throughout everything, I started finding more and more insects that were being introduced from outside coming in and the reasons for that is because there is no chemicals, there is no chemical residue, so nature was actually coming in to be helpful. Even the places I was adding insects to, you know, there was ladybugs, there was lacewings, there was all these additional things from outside that were coming in to be helpful as well. So being effective is obviously um, a way of using this and, and it wouldn't be, um, I, I guess it, I, I couldn't use this product if it wasn't effective which makes more sense, so. Um, Plant Health 101, uh, you guys know probably far better than I, you know, that this is just the basics here is what it is. And I learned that a long time ago about just going back to the basics, you know, um, sanitation. So practice and promote a clean environment, basically, where we were coming in. Sanitation really helps out with you know, pathogens, diseases, uh, all these outside sources that become an issue with your plants, just doing your due diligence on keeping a clean environment as much as possible. Um, you go from the ground up, so healthy soil is where a lot of people start out as well. You know, healthy plants uh, have great rooting system, they have great soils uh, that input into the plant, you know, where the plant can uptake and, and create a self-defense mechanism on its own um, to where you, ha you minimize everything on the back end. So if you take care of it on the front end, it's gonna be more helpful uh, trying to take care of the situation later on. Um, basics again, maintain appropriate nutrients and watering. Healthy plants can mitigate their regular pest intrusions. So again, you know, a healthy plant can uh, basically fight off minor pathogens, uh, pest, disease, 
Um, it, I, I kind of equate it similar to humans, you know what I mean? Uh, when, when we're more healthy, we can do more things for the most part. When our system is down, that's when problems and issues, additional issues can arise at that point. So I always tell people just to start out with uh, uh, growing the most healthy plants they can possible. Um, when I started using uh, beneficial insects, I, I really started at a small scale. Uh, for me, my propagation, one of them was uh, 30,000 square feet of propagation that we were going after. And uh, I, I recall treating for fungus gnats was one of our main issues as they were feeding on the rooting system, you know, of our fresh cutting. So I was trying to figure out a way of doing this without, um, with, I guess, the most natural way, the most effective way. And it seemed like um, foliar sprays or drenches into the soil that we were working with became really difficult, you know. Uh, one, it wasn't really that effective. Uh, but the second part about it is you have employees as well. You have people around that you're working around and you want to you want to you want to have that chance to be working with your plants anytime you want as much as possible basically without managing people around that specific area because there's re-entries that need to be involved with chemicals uh, and sprays that people do. So, you know, uh, starting out small for me was just focusing on one thing, one issue, which was uh, fungus net control. And when I started using uh, a, a living soil mite that dwells in your soil, um, and it feeds on the larval stages uh, of the fungus nets, within about three weeks, um, I could see a noticeable difference on just the sticky cards that we had in the facility where we were working. You know, they go from, I, I would say, completely plastered to, you know, there was a 30% decline to, you know, three weeks later, there was probably 80% mitigation of just fungus gnats for maybe one application of a, a predatory mite into your soil. Um, you know, a living mite that are feeding on, on the root, in and around your rooting system on soft-bodied arthropods and, and kind of cleaning up everything. So again, that goes back to a healthy plant starting from the roots. Um, so again, I started small with just one, one type of thing, rather than jumping in and trying to treat your whole area or treat every pest you have, whether it's uh, fungus gnats, root aphids, thrips, mites, uh, it's easier to get your feet wet and get the understanding of what you're doing uh, before you move on any further. Um, second part to get started is uh, team effort and organization. Uh, it seems like if, if your whole team is not on board or, or does not want to be involved in everything, it seems like you won't be fighting as much. If people are together and everybody's on the same page and they want to be doing the same thing, it just makes your operation more successful, I guess you'd say. Uh, everybody's there to do the right thing. Everybody's on the same page to uh, looking for the final outcome on, on how to use this program specifically and make it effective for you and your company, basically. So I, I feel that's a, a big part of it is when you, not just you or your grower, uh, but everybody else there is, is out looking uh, for the health and safety of the plants that you guys are growing. Um, I've talked about sanitation just once or twice, you know, creating a clean environment, and I think that's geared a lot towards, it is geared a lot towards indoor facilities possibly, but even cultivating, you know, outside, uh, removing dead plant debris, um, just kind of cleaning up and making sure that the grounds you're growing on are the safest, uh, I guess, so that there's no uh, intrusions of anything else coming in. So just sanitation. Uh, using beneficial insects, uh, regular scouting and monitoring really becomes uh, something that I, I don't know necessarily about how everybody grows, but it's really, it's different going from a spray program to a beneficial program because you need to understand, you know, number one, what pests that you have out there, but number two, what predatory mites you guys may be using, and you need to be able to visualize and see what they are because if they're on your plants, you know, around the pests that you have, then you have a better feeling that things are going to be taken care of, that you don't need to, let's say, reach for the gun and, and go for a spray type thing. So um, scouting and monitoring has got to be, you know, far up on your priority list to take the time to do that. Uh, but not just taking the time to do it, but understanding what you're looking for. whether it be the pests that you have, but also, you know, the juveniles, the eggs, and you need to know the reproduction cycles of what you're looking at as well uh, to make that decision on what to do from there, basically. 
Um, segregation, uh, if people have space to segregate and, and move, I would say, unhealthy plants or infected plants to the side, you know, that's going to be a, a great part of it so that they basically don't infect others that are in your area. So, again, if this, this might be geared more towards indoor versus outdoor, but if you can physically remove and create a barrier in between one plant versus the next, it's going to be much more helpful so that it doesn't spread, basically. Um, and again, at the very bottom one is pest idea is critical. Um, you, you, can't really, you can't really treat for something unless you know what it is. You know what I mean? I mean, you can look around and you can play the guessing game. I mean, there's so many calls regarding broad mite and russet mite and things like that where people say, I think I have this or I think I have that. You know, it's really nice uh, going back to a microscope for identification. You, you really need to know what you're treating for uh, in order to make that specific recommendation on, on uh, how, how to clean it up, basically. Because you can do a broad spectrum of things, but you know, in the future, it's always nice to have that education, have that experience on, on treatment moving forward. So if you ever experience it again, then you kind of have a, a, a really good idea on what you're going to do moving forward for it. So pest ID has got to be on the top uh, for using beneficials, regardless of if it's you know, uh, beneficial insects or anything like that. But you, you really need to know the pests that you're going after. Um, I just pulled a couple things uh, for common scouting tools that I guess I, I used to use uh, just on a regular basis. Um, I don't know how many of you out there use uh, sticky cards. Um, it's not just to trap pests that you have, but it's also to give you an idea of what you guys have in your crop. Uh, it, it gives you an idea of the populations that you have out there. But again, that's going back to pest identification, as you guys need to know uh, what's in your crop out there uh, to give you a good idea on how to treat it, or at least be preventative on what you need to look for uh, going ahead in cultivation. Um, I used to use uh, flags a lot to <clears throat> not necessarily, you know, I guess I'd say keep some of my employees out of that specific area. I would use red flags where I saw that there was higher pest densities in a specific area because I wouldn't want my employees to walk in that specific area and look at everything and then walk back out and spread it throughout the nursery. I mean, you can carry a lot of pests on you to a way to do that. So I used to use actually red flags for people to stay out of, basically, unless I had this, my scouting team that was doing it. You know, they understood what we were doing, but at least for the most part, we would wait until the end of the day to scout again, if necessary, where our flags were. Uh, that way, after we did that, we would just go home. We wouldn't be spreading it throughout the facility. So I always felt that flags were a big tool, uh, sticky cards were helpful, and if you find something that you don't know what it is and you can't figure it out while you're out in the field per se, uh, just you know, regular sandwich bags or Ziploc bags, you can, uh, you can put leaf samples in there. And even if it's not a pest that's associated with the leaves, I mean, even if it's a disease looking leaf, you can put these in the sandwich bags and carry them back where again, you have those, uh, the microscopes to take a look at things so that you can, you can do a proper identification and, and try to figure out exactly what you're trying to combat uh, before moving forward. Um, talking about, again, common scouting tools, but uh, microscopes, I, I, I put a few of them here that should cover almost everybody's needs for the most part. You can see at the top right here, the smaller one is just a regular hand loop um, is what they call them. I think it goes to like 25 magnification is what it is. You know, many pests you're gonna be able to see with a visual eye. It's not gonna be that difficult to see a two spot spider mite. It's not difficult to see an adult thrip, uh, white fly, aphids. It's, it's very visual, it's very simple to see that with the naked eye, but you know, in order for better identification, there's a hand loop is just what I call it. It's gonna make it real simple. It's gonna make it quick and easy for you guys to take a look at what you have out there. Um, Beneath that is another handheld uh, that we've used. Uh, I mean, it's real simple. We got it off Amazon for 20 bucks or 25, but it goes up to 100 magnification. So if you are out in the field, it's something that you can use if you have a place to place your leaves or your dirt or whatever you're looking at. It just gives you ideas on uh, uh, more ample uh, magnification, you know, if it's going to be a broad mite or a russet mite, which generally takes at least 60 magnification or more to see these things. So um, again, it's just a helpful tool. Um, I think the thing that really opened my eyes up a long time ago is, is on the, on the right-hand side here is the digital microscope. Uh, you're able to hook that up to your computer and really get a, a visual of what you're looking at rather than using these tiny little, you know, scopes that you're trying to look through to make an idea of it. You can use one of these uh, digital scopes that hooks up to your computer. 
Uh, it gives you a, a great visual, but also you can take videos, you can take images, you know, uh, still screenshots of what you're looking at. And if you guys can't figure out what you're going after, at least you have proof or pictures or images of, of somebody that you can send it to to get help for that. Again, going back to pest identification, but this thing really opens your eyes up as you're looking through your soil, as you're looking at the leaves. I mean, you can see, you can see the transpiration of leaves just by one of these at 60 magnification. You can see the tiny expiration balls that leaves will put out on here. So it, it, again, it just, it's educating, it, it's knowing what you guys are going after um, and trying to treat for it from there. If you guys have any questions throughout the thing, just raise your hand and we can go through it. Yes. Yeah, so I guess what, what I touched on, what I mean by sanitation is just having a, a, a clean environment to start out with. But I mean, even basic things that we would use is just using gloves as much as possible, you know. Small gloves, uh, even the clippers that you use to work in your plants, having those clean with, you know, basically it could be a peroxide base or a cleaning agent for the most part to take care of that. It wasn't necessarily in our plants what we use to clean them, uh, but just the tools that you, you use as you're working in your plants. You know, sweeping, like I said, taking out dead debris that could bring in pathogens and things like that. Sweeping, raking, you know, cleaning everything up as much as possible so there isn't any inputs on getting into your grow. Sure, but for the most part, you know, those bugs are going to be gone with your plants. You know what I mean? If you are sanitizing an indoor uh, operation or grow uh, space there, I think for the most part, a lot of them are going to be going out on your plants at that stage. Uh, I couldn't answer that. Uh, I don't. Could you repeat that? Did you guys hear that or would you like to hear it again? Yeah. Hi, Peter. So your question was if pollination is greater when fewer insecticides are used. Absolutely, yeah. Because you'll, you'll have a greater biodiversity. So you wouldn't just have the honeybees that would be released that are kind of considered livestock you'd have more flies even that can pollinate too. And then by reducing systemic insecticides, organophosphates and bifenthrin, in general, the plant health is increased. Thank you, Mariah. Yes. Yeah, we're not there yet, but we'll get into it. just the basics of, you know, what, what predaceous insects to use in, in which environments, basically. 
and, that, and, and it's different. You know, there's documentation on a lot of predatory mites, even though there's also anecdotal evidence that we've used, you know, with growers where, you know, one mite may say it only goes down to 40% humidity, even though this last year, you know, we used them at 15% humidity and saw results in that. So uh, there's documentation, documentation versus uh, literal things that are working for them, and we will get to it. We're going to start on it right now. You know, fungus gnats and, and root aphids is, you know, again, starting from the soil up, basically. So um, things that... I guess you'd say frequent pests in cannabis that we get called for. Uh, these are just a couple images of, of, of both of them that we've gone through. Um, again, it goes down to pest identification. Uh, but fungus nets is again where I started to uh, you know, work in uh, the use of beneficial insects. And it's very simple to use a predatory mite to take care of uh, fungus gnat larva. But these are just a few pictures uh, that we've gathered as we go through. Um, I, I consider it, and this is again personal experience, guys. I mean, it's not like what I say is going to be effective for everybody. Um, and there is other controls that you can use, like nematodes, stuff like that. Uh, Stradiolalop simitis is a soil dwelling mite uh, that I use from day one, basically. Uh, it feeds on fungus gnat larva, uh, pupating thrip. I kind of say soft bodied arthropods that are in and around your rooting system, where, you know, it helps that base of growing healthy plants with healthy roots, with healthy soil. Um, it's kind of the bottom, working from the ground up, basically. Um, but I've used it for many different things, and uh, I'll have to, I don't have any proof of this by any means, but I wrote down on a sticky note, you know, a lot of growers are working against symphylans also. And I've only done a trial or so uh, on an acre plot where I've used uh, the beneficial insect stradiolalops, and, and it was effective. Not to say that it was the only means or controls of the symphylum, but it was helpful and it lasted over a year for control at that stage. So that was just a side note I wanted to make sure and touch base on with symphylums. And, you know, they're, they're difficult altogether. Uh, I, <laughs> there's, there's nothing that we could say that is going to take care of your problems. It's just going to be helpful uh, on using the soil mite. Um, the other one that I've listed here is called Delosha, or it used to be called Atheta coriaria for, for many years. Um, and again, it's another soil dwelling insect uh, that's going to help in and around your rooting system. It's a little bit more aggressive, it seems, than the, than, than the mites that are there. And I generally use it as a help with cleanup, basically. Um, for the most part, the soil mite's going to take care of a lot of your issues. And again, it's just the first part. You know, there's many steps into growing. Um, and again, it starts with your soil, and this could be one of them to start out with these two here. So the question is about the soil mites. Uh, in the absence of a food source, um, feeding on organic matter, and, and yes, I mean, that, that's true. For the most part, it's going to feed on the soft-bodied arthropods first, um, and then it's going to go to, if there's organic matter and debris, it will feed on that. There's going to be no negativity towards your plants at all for that, but it does meter its populations that way as well if it has a food source or no food source available for it. I would just talk about these two that I know of. I mean, for the most part, these are the most commonly used in the soil there. And I just, you know, just as you do, reading material, the Stradiolalops is one that I know of. The Theta, I don't know for sure on about it. Okay. Yes. I, be, I believe they do all the trials that I've used for them. And, you know, I used to run trials in greenhouses for these. So the company I used to work for, if we had a, a large pest population or problem in the greenhouses we worked at, you know, their common practice was to clean it out, sell it, and then drench the soil with a chemical. And when we continually had problems year after year after year, I searched for something else to use. Um, and I started using the stradiolalops in the soil and found that there would be not only more effective, but the longevity was there for sure. 
I believe so. Uh, depending on how you're growing and what you're doing. I mean, there's a lot of people that use nematodes as well. I don't think, uh, I, I, I personally use nematodes more of as a knockdown, but for longevity, I don't think they last as long. So it depends on the substrate that you're growing in, depends on if it dries out or if it's moist. I mean, there's a lot of variables for it. But yeah, I mean, you hit on the head for, you know, the hemp russet mite. I, I think this is a number one defense system because, you know, yeah, for the bottom, for sure. I mean, again, because it feeds on almost everything that's in your soil system. So it, I, what I say is it helps kind of creates a barrier from any pests moving up. Not that it's going to comp completely eradicate your problem. I think they actually feed on the nematodes is what it does, which would encourage more reproduction of them. That's what I would recommend, yes. Yes. Sure. The question is, when's the best time to introduce predatory mites into your operation here? And I guess before I, I, I answer that, it, it's easy to say that preventative applications of beneficial insects are far more effective than trying to clean up a problem, basically. And that's going to go for, you know, even if you were to, say, use chemicals, you know, it, it's easier treating a, a low pest population than it is a full-blown uh, problem, I guess you'd say, or issue. So to answer your question, yeah, I mean, the sooner that you can apply the beneficial insects, the better it's going to be in your operation as you carry it through to flower and uh, to harvest, basically. Um, he's asking about root aphid control for these as well, and root aphids probably, as, as many people have encountered, are a pain in the ass and real difficult. Um, as far as I know right now, there's not a predatory mite or insect that takes care of adult root aphids. Um, I do have different feedback from customers that have, you know, the root aphids have, they, they've used the soil mites and the beetles to feed on uh, the, the younger stages of the root aphids before it becomes the adult. Um, and it, it basically it grows out of their operation as, as they're treating preventatively all the stuff that's coming in here. Yes. Yeah, there is, you know, there's chemicals that take care of root aphids, unfortunately, and I don't really recommend to use chemicals for that. For the most part, it's just growing out of it becomes simple. Um, yes. Uh, invite predatory uh, or predaceous insects into your area. Um, I used to use a lot of bean plants. I don't know in depth about them. I mean, I was pretty limited in my operation that I used, you know, very little uh, bean plants for me were introductions or what I would call, um, uh, what, what did I call them? Uh, were, were not, not necessarily trap plants, but a plants for monitoring just because they showed up, you know, white fly, aphids, thrips. I mean, everything was attracted to bean plants for the most part. Uh, marigolds was something, uh, uh, Elysium, I think, uh, th introduces thrips or brings them towards them. Uh, I, I wouldn't know enough to tell you what to use specifically, I guess, to answer it that way. Sure, and it is, and you know, and, and going through even cannabis, there's not a ton of pollen or anything at all anyways for production, and generally that's why there's reintroductions when we have predatory mites that are going in there, so. Um, so these were just the two that we're going to go, uh, fungus net and root aphids, I mean, these have been the best uh, at control or preventing these, basically. Uh, there's not an adult uh, or anything that takes care of adult root aphids, basically, so um, again, going to preventative techniques is what we're looking for. Um, these were just submitted uh, online to us for identification at, at, at some point, and you know, broad mites is one of them, and hemp russet mites is the other. Um, I, the russet mites look like small little blunts or you know, small baseball bats, and 
if you can see the magnification for the, the hemp russet mite, I think it offers at 0 .2, 0 0.02 millimeters is how small they are uh, when you're looking at that. So um, it's really the magnification um, on, on making a pest identification that you're looking at. Many times if you can visually see uh, a pest or an issue that you're having on your plant, it's not going to be one of these for the most part. You can see that there's a little minor dusting of it, but until you get a microscope on to take a look at it, um, it's really nice to see what you're going after first before making a recommendation for it. Um, now we're going to get into uh, controls on um, the broad mite and, and russet mites. Um, and again, this is, this is all based off grower feedback. Uh, to our company on the customers that we work with on what's been, I would say, most effective for them. Um, Amblesius andersoni and Amblesius phalassus. Uh, these have been two, I guess you'd say, broad range uh, predators. And, and what I mean by broad range is that they're not specialists per se. You know, like Persimilis is very specialist for two-spot spider mite. It doesn't feed on anything else. Uh, andersoni and phalassus seem to feed on um, two spot spider mites, uh, broad mite, russet mites. Um, and then I know the Andersoni feeds on some thrips larvae as well. So it's a general uh, type treatment that covers a lot of different things if you're looking at preventative controls. Um, but you got to understand that they're slow feeders also. So you wouldn't want to use them necessarily as I need immediate gratification. I need to clean something up right away. There's different things that you can use in different areas. Um, and, and these would be the first that we found to be real effective. Um, I brought a couple things up here to show you guys uh, the different packaging, I guess you'd say, for product. And I'm sure there's people that have used these before, but they're called, they're called slow release sachets. And I call them breeding bags is what they are, but they have an exit hole in the back here. And you can literally pull each of these tabs off, one, two, three, four, five, six of these tabs, and you can apply them to the bottom of your plant. What I tell people is they're like a Christmas tree ornament that you're attaching to your plant, basically. But it's a breeding bag or slow release sachet that uh, the predatory might slowly release onto your plants into the canopy of your leaf surface, and they're looking for food. You know, so the predatory mites, they're feeding on the pests that you guys have in your garden. That's one way of doing it. As I say, you know, a preventative control and a treatment that you guys can do. Uh, all the documentation will say they can last up to six weeks for one application. I mean, just so you know, I have very few customers that give me feedback that say they've lasted six weeks. But you can open them up and take a look at them inside here for the most part. Uh, they average out, I say, about four weeks per application is that you can look at. Um, these are geared more towards preventative releases versus this is the same product, Andersoni, just packaged differently in a liter container. And the liter containers, you're looking at more active adults, I guess you'd say. So rather than slowly releasing, if you were to have a problem, you would want to apply more active adults that are, you know, in, in the beneficial insect world, that would be more immediate gratification. Even though, the, even though I guess the outcome is still slower using the insects, you can easily clean up a situation by adding, you know, adults in there to feed more often, basically. I equate them very similar to us, though. I mean, pred predatory mites, they, they need to feed. It's not like they sit there and they feed all day long and, you know, and eat on everything that they come into. There's also a resting phase that they go through and then they have to go through a reproduction stage as well uh, where there's more that's coming into it. Um, besides those, um, I, I generally use those two um, as a preventative. There's also Amblesia swirsky, Amblesia cucumeris, and the lady in the back that asked about, you know, humidities and environmental control. Um, Andersoni and Phalassus were the two I spoke with prior. They can generally go down to lower lower temperatures, or I'm sorry, lower humidities, higher temperatures. Um, I think Swirsky is more geared towards uh, hotter situations and more drier environments for the humidity that you're looking at. But Swirsky and Cucumeris don't necessarily feed on two-spot spider mites very well. So you have to understand that there's kind of something for everything. You can do a broad-based program, and then if you have any type of flare-ups uh, for broad and russet mite, Swirsky and Cucumeris have been so far the biggest that I've seen to be most effective for it. And I think when it comes down to that, it's really, you know, 
when you applied it, how much you applied, and how often that you did your applications in order for eradication at that stage. So there isn't like a set standard on, you know, five feet of plant because it just depends on the production stages of the pest that you have. And that's what goes back to uh, proper monitoring and scouting. You want to find your pest populations at the lowest stage so that you can treat them right away and go from there. The question was, can you over apply these predators? And in experience, I don't, I don't think there would be any problems with doing that. Again, they're looking at the pests that you have, you know, in your plants. They're not feeding on your plant surfaces, basically. Does that make sense? Okay. Somebody asked about Californicus. Uh, Californicus, um, from what I've used in the past, is geared more towards, and I'm, and, and it's going to be on the next couple here. Uh, I think Californicus is geared more towards two spot spider mite. Um, to be effective in that. I've used uh, Persimilis and Californicus for two spots. Uh, Californicus seems to do very similar as Swirsky. It, it, it can reproduce at lower humidity temperatures, uh, lower humidity percentages and higher uh, temperatures, basically. Uh, that was probably one of the first questions I got uh, over three years ago starting this. And what I, I, I didn't know at that time, um, and I encouraged uh, all the people I started working with to ask their labs about it. And it's been over three years, and it's never tested negative for any feces of any sorts. Well, it just depends on, you know, I, I guess I wasn't really understanding or talking about nematodes at that time for wiping out other things. But, yeah, it's just going to be dependent and variable on what you apply, how much you apply, and, and what you have in your soil and what you have in your plants at that point. You know, kind of like you said, applying predatory mites early in the season, if they were to feed on things and eradicate the situation to where you don't have any others from there, then obviously their feces or their excrement is going to be gone at that point when you go to the testing stage. But I do have customers in Nevada that, you know, they go through even towards, uh, not end of harvest, but, you know, week five and six that haven't had any issues on testing either in Nevada. It, it, it is that it's Uh, so I guess not, well, just to finish out this part of it, uh, these are just two options, I guess you'd say, as more of a curative standpoint, uh, applying uh, additional adults to, uh, to specific spots that people are going towards. And it seems like using biocontrol, of, of what I've seen, is that you don't have a pest issue over your entire harvest or your entire garden by any means. It seems like when I've used this in the past for the last 10 years, it's like they really become localized into one spot, basically. Rather than have a low pest population over your entire garden, it seems like they go to one area. And it seems to me that they're hurting them is what it is.
the question is, is do these beneficials work well together? And I think it's specific on what you're going after. Um, the way I sort of answer that is I've always been taught that Californicus is one of the only ones that will feed on other predatory mite eggs. Um, but again, using Californicus with another predatory mite, they're not going to go after each other and try to, you know, to feed on each other for the most part. I think it's going to be helpful. Uh, and again, it's going to come down to the amounts that you're applying and the situation that they're going in. As a general rule, rule most of them play well together. Um, but again, I don't think it's going to be detrimental to apply something that doesn't play well with it. I think their general food source, or again, are the pests that you have first is what they're going to go for. So the first couple that I spoke about, the Atheta beetle and the Stratiolalops are soil dwelling that you would apply to the top of your soil, and they would literally burrow down into the soil. And the other ones are for basically the canopy of your plant. A couple ways of applying them or putting them, uh, you, can, you can apply small piles to the base of the plant, and the natural searching for them is to go up, basically. Um, companies have created hanging baskets, or what I call them, where you can scoop out the adults in the leader containers into the baskets, which ensures that everything goes directly into your canopy. And then there's the slow-release sachets that I have here as well that I showed you, uh, which kind of guarantees that every, everything goes into your plant. We've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, another frequent pest in cannabis, uh, or agriculture, I guess you'd say, is two-spot spider mite and thrips. Um, going back to Californicus, uh, question on that, I, I, I feel that Persimilis is, is hands down the better aggressor. Um, the only problem with Persimilis is without a food source, uh, it, it dies of starvation within three or four days. It doesn't last very long. So the time that you guys want to use them is when you visually see two spot spider mites. You know, it's not a good preventative unless you see something for it to feed on because it doesn't last very long. Um, Californicus would be the second one that I would use more towards two spot spider mites, even though it feeds on other, you know, possibly broad and russet mites. I just feel that the other ones are better. And again, this is just me, guys. Everybody has their own experiences using things. Uh, but Californicus will last longer and persist longer than the Persimilis will. So immediate control, I think the Persimilis is going to be there as a, a quicker knockdown. It's going to feed quicker for the most part. It feeds on the eggs is what it does, so it disrupts reproduction for that, yes. Yeah, I use those sometimes, and again, personal experiences, so it's great that you guys have luck with that. I've uh, The feedback that I've gotten with the lace wings, it just, again, it depends on the time that you apply them um, and how you apply them to your crop. It hasn't been as good, I guess you'd say, as persimilis, but the green lace wings are going to feed on other things as well. Um, it's not like they're a direct predator of them, but yes, they can be beneficial for sure. They'll stay around longer and helpful, yes. Yep. No, those are the only two I was going to talk about for two spot. Just they're, they're just you know the, the main aggressors I guess you'd say for them. Uh, going into thrips, uh, I don't know how many people run into this. I mean, you can see these indoors, you can see them outdoors. Um, starting with the Stratiolalops that we spoke about, that feeds on the pupating thrip, so that's step number one. Um, Swirsky or Cucumeris will feed on the first instar only. Uh, it doesn't do anything for the second instar, but it actually uh, decreases the the uh, the, the amount of time that they do bothering the second instar decreases the populations of them because it tires them out, basically. Um, and the fourth one I have listed here is Aureus. Uh, Aureus is one of the uh, only ones that I know of that will feed on adult thrips, basically. But it feeds on anything above the soil surface, so it will feed on the instars as well going into it. Aureus is great, especially in flowering cannabis as well. It's not bothered by the trichomes of the plant. It doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't get stuck for the most part. I think I've only had one complaint that they had one Aureus stuck in their flower. Uh, other than that, it's big enough and it's strong enough not to get stuck. But you know, it feeds on adult thrips. It feeds on aphids. It feeds on eggs. It feeds on spider mites. It does a lot of different things, and, and especially when you contain it in a greenhouse or an indoor facility. Uh, it really goes to town and feeds on many different things. 
Um, so <clears throat> just leaving in this, uh, again, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you it's not the easiest thing to do uh, using beneficial insects uh, for everything. So I, I think commitment is critical. Uh, ex always expect a learning, learning curve. I mean, we still, I still am 10 years later using this. I, I try to get feedback from people on what things are working out well in best situations. And, you know, at times there's things that we've written off to be not effective. And then you have people tell you that it's been great for them. So it's real difficult to be very specific on everything. I feel where, where people can be specific is find the, the ones that are more effective more often and use those. Uh, for the most part, rather than try to implement six or seven or eight different things, keep it simple on the ones that are uh, effective for you guys. Uh, again, expect a learning curve. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, I always say chemicals should always be used as a last resort. Um, and I'm guessing a lot of you that are in here are thinking the same thing as well. Um, and the very last thing would to be, you know, I always tell people to be confident. I, I recall the first time that I used this and, you know, my production manager kind of laughed at me when I told him, I wanted to use beneficial insects, and he was kind of smiling at me, kind of going, you know, do whatever you want, but uh, we'll just see the results there. <clears throat> in order for people to see to believe, you have to use it uh, in an effective way, and I think that's what it is. When I hear people that say I've used biocontrol and it doesn't work, um, I really think it matters on when you use it, what specific beneficial insect you use, and how often you're doing applications for it. The difficult part about cannabis cultivation is, is the plant itself is so physical, you know. I mean, it's sticky, it's hairy, and it, and it creates big problems for using beneficial insects, but it can be effective, and it has been for a long time, uh, just using natural predators for pest management for you guys. I have not. I learned about it a long time ago in blueberries and everything from there. You know, people initially, they just went to spray things for it. And I haven't gotten into it at all to answer anything for you. Sorry. Spotted wing drysophila for fruits. Yeah. I source them from insectaries. There's probably five, maybe six large insectaries worldwide. So for the most part, they all come from a, a bigger facility that culture them. Um, I know the ones that I source are not, but uh, I couldn't answer it for the other facilities. So he's asking if it's all or nothing using beneficial insects for, I guess you'd say, pest management. And, you know, that's something where uh, IPM comes in or integrated pest management where you can use them, yes, to be effective for certain things. Again, it's the longevity on how long they're going to be around in case you need to use something for powdery mildew or stuff like that. I always went to bioinsecticides, and this was 10 years ago because I was trying to find the safest thing to use just growing, you know, field plants is what I was doing. The safest thing, not just for the beneficials, but the employees and the safety of everybody. I got into bioinsecticides, biofungicides at that point, and now reading, starting to get into those more. Um, it's going to be personally what you'd like to do because I think there's negative impact on pollination on the other sides of those as well. So it's not necessarily all or nothing. It could be a program that you set up yourself, you know, to integrate uh, other, other chemicals per se or oils or something into your operation. What do you mean what I think of it? Yeah, Nemo, I mean, the mode of action is suffocation. It's really a soft product. It's going to help, you know, with fungicides, uh, bactericides. It's a, an insecticide per se. I think it depends on what you use and, and how it's formulated because there's so many different formulations of neem, uh, and it's included in a lot of different plants. Um, again, you know, obviously I would shoot for beneficial insects for any of those reasons, but if you needed to spot treat an area, I, I, I you know, you kind of do what you want at that stage. Um, 
Uh, yeah, and, and, and I can't speak too much about Neem. I, I wasn't heavily induced in using it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it works for a lot of different things. It's all uh, the integration process that you go about doing everything. Yeah, that, that's why I said from the very beginning, it would suffocate them if you're applying them later on, basically. Yeah, afterwards. Yeah, there's not much that will kill the eggs unless you have some type of oversight in there, so. Is it? Got it. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's the way that they culture. I really couldn't answer that, you know. But it also comes down to, yeah, these these aren't they they don't all cost the same price. Everything's priced differently. So what I always went for.